Welcome to the Tour and Private Cellar. I'm Charles Williams, I'm the Cellar Master here. Please join me for a private tasting where we will briefly discuss the history of our farm. Then we'll go to my favorite place, um, the vineyards, where we will cover a little bit of the topic of organic farming, as well as all the little techniques that we use to guide the berries and the vines to actually become the best they can possibly be. Then we'll follow the path of the grape all the way into the cellar, where we'll gently guide it towards the sumptuous wine that you always find in the glass when you join the glass of the Turin. We, as the Turin, um, frame ourselves on being the first winery in South Africa to introduce a full fire variety, Bordeaux blend, red Bordeaux blend, of course, which simply means that you utilize all the varieties that you are able to plant in Bordeaux, France, namely Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Malbec, and Petit Bordeaux. We express the different portions of our farm, the different aspects essentially, the different soil types, in five different wines, all of them here behind me. So the Turin Delica, the Fusion 5, the Turin Z, and the two wines on top, the Book 17 and the Black Diamond. Please join me outside and let's start this exciting journey. Welcome to the vineyards. As I mentioned, this is my absolute favorite place in the world. So maybe let's first just look at geology. So where we're standing at the moment, it's something called the Kales River Pluton. Um, so that's just the model of the material on which we are standing, which is about 450 million years old. And I always, when I'm standing right here, I, I almost get this overwhelming sense of um, just being fortunate enough to be a little speck of history in that uh, period of time. So the Turin actually got founded not on the purpose of actually to start make wine. It was a very serendipitous um, series of events that took place that helped us to realize that where we are standing, the area lends itself to making quality red wine. Um, two of the factors that really influence this is the ocean breeze, which I will discuss in a moment, and then the complexity of our soils. Now, like I mentioned, our soils is around about 450 million years old. If you come a little bit closer to the surface, you'll find up to as much as 15 different soil types, um, which we farm on. So all of these have just got slight variations of what they will lend towards the crop growing on it. And that's actually where the, where the five variety Bordeaux blend took hold. Um, when we analyzed each of these individual soil types, we saw that different varieties would really thrive on them. So for instance, if you've got a little bit of a stronger soil type, like oak leaf, um, something like Petit Verdot will really flourish there. For Malbec, you need a much poorer soil type, something like Static Spray. And Cabernet, you want a little bit more rock fragment. For Merlot, you want a little bit more clay fragment. So once we did all the analysis on our soil, we said, what varieties will fit in there? One of the five Bordeaux varieties actually ticked the box. And that's where the light went on and we say, we are in an area where we can make brilliant red wines. Um, the sea breeze will hugely help us in, in that influence. We do have the soils to accommodate each of these wines. And that's what we said. Let's take that concept from Bordeaux, which is hugely successful. Let's put it on South African soils and let's express it in a South African way. And I think that's what we've been able to do hugely successful over the past 20 years. So what we envision for our, for our wines is to make wines that really reflect the soils and it must really reflect what you see here behind me. And that's what we do through the blend. So essentially on our farm of 21 hectares, we've got an area that's west facing and an area that's south facing. So the south facing vineyards are here behind me, all facing the false bay in the background. The west facing vineyards face Table Mountain from where I'm standing at the moment. So just by looking at the aspect, you're going to have two very distinguished vineyards. The south facing one for us here in the southern hemisphere will get the least sun, the west facing, of course, the most sun. And what we're going to express in the two wines, the Fusion 5, which is coming from the west facing vineyard, is that little bit darker fruit, the little bit more volume, exactly what the site will actually give you. And we do that through a left bank Bordeaux style wine, dominated by Cabernet Sauvignon, big portion of Malbec, and then smaller portions of Merlot, Cabernet Franc, and Petit Verdot. On the south facing vineyards, which is of course going to be a little bit colder, we actually want to express that little bit more freshness, that leanness, a little bit more of the purity almost of the, the area. And we do that through Merlot and Cap Franc as the majority partners. 
um, smaller portions of Cabernet Sauvio, Malbec, and again a little bit of, of Petit Verdot just to bring everything together. We're standing in a block of Merlot at the moment, so this vines next to me is actually the main driving force behind the Detour and Z. Um, I'd actually just like to take a moment and just step a little bit backwards and look at vineyards as a whole and how they will contribute to the actual quality of the final product, um, the wine. So vineyards are the most important part. Essentially, it has to come from the soil and it has to come from the sun. That's what we bottle at the end of the day. Um, as I previously mentioned, we've got an abundance of different soil types here at the Turin, 15 to be exactly um, precise on that. And what you've got to do in the vineyard is you've got to create balance. Um, that's actually what we're trying to do. If you can create a balanced vine that's growing in a complex terroir, that's where you end up growing grapes that are complex, vibrant, expressive. Um, and that's what you want to have to take into the cellar. From there, you can make complex, balanced wines. If you don't have complex, balanced grapes, you can't do it in the cellar. So there's actually a lot of steps that we take to make sure that we pair up the perfect vine to the perfect soil. So what we'll do, first of all, is we look at the intrinsic characteristics of the vine. So as I mentioned, we've got the five different varieties of which Malbec is a very aggressive grower. Petit Verdot is a very shy grower. And you have, then you've got the three varieties, Merlot, Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sommelier, which are nice balanced growers. So again, goal for us is to make balance in the vineyards. So what we'll do is for Merlot, Cab Franc, Cab Sauv, you'll match the, the vines up to balanced soils. For the Cabernet Sauvignon, a little bit more of a rock fragment. For the Merlot, soils with a little bit more of a clay, higher clay content. What's very important, as I mentioned, Malbec is a prolific grower. So if you're going to put that on a balanced soil, it's just going to grow and grow and grow. So the whole focus of the vine will actually shift towards growing leaves and not towards growing perfect berries. So that's why it's extremely important to put our Malbec on our most poorest soil. The soil will then actually inhibit or restrict the wine, the vine from just going crazy. A lot more focus will go into the berries and that will make this really juicy berries that we need for Malbec. Vice versa, um, Petit Verdot genetically is one of these vines that gives you a lot of grapes, but it doesn't grow a lot of leaves, which essentially means that your, your vine is out of balance. So by putting your Petit Verdot on your, on your strongest soil, you're going to just stimulate the plant to grow a little bit stronger, a little bit more healthy, which means that the crop becomes in balance and you end up again growing really expressive Petit Verdot berries, which is the job of that variety. Where we're standing right now, this is our Merlot vines. Um, they've been harvested about 20 days ago. We actually just finished harvest four days um, prior to shooting this video. So what I'd like to take a moment is, is just look at the little finer things that we have to do to just help nature to make the best possible berries. So first of all, it comes back to balance again. So it starts off with the vine, planting it on the right soils. Once you get that balance right, 90% of the work is done. And that's where we as humans can come in to just do that little bit of tweaks to get the perfection that we need. So first thing is actually establishing that balance that you've established in the soil in the top year. So what we'll do is, this is called the spur. So from each spur, which would have been last year's shoot, you will leave two buds that will give you two shoots um, in the new growing season. Genetically, each of these shoots, and I'm just gonna remove these, will give you two bunches. So now you can imagine, for each shoot you see over here, you will have two bunches. The more shoots you have, the more crowded the bunches will be. And that's going to have a huge impact on quality. So what we'll look at is, as the, is first of all, the, the potential of the soil. How much bunches every single um, vine has to, to ripen. And then we'll go on a shoot level and we'll actually decide this shoot is strong enough to ripen two bunches perfectly and we'll give it two shoots, ah, two bunches. We'll go to the next shoot, a little bit shorter, maybe a little bit less leaves, and we'll say, okay, this shoot will only be able to ripen one bunch to perfection. Next shoot, maybe a little bit too short to ripen any bunches whatsoever, and we'll throw all of that off. So once we've gone from shoot to shoot, making sure that everyone is perfect, we will then go on to a bunch level, and we'll say, okay, 
This bunch is absolutely perfect. We keep it as is. We'll go to the next bunch, which for Merlot might have a little side shoulder, which will not ripen exactly the same as the main bunch. And we'll even remove that. Now to put that into context for you, we're a very small farm of only 21 hectares. But if you count all the bunches on all the vines, you will end up with almost a million bunches. Um, these bunches gets visited by a team of 10 ladies that will look at every single one at least two, three, four times a season. No small feat if you think about it. So three years ago, we started this amazing quest um, to actually become organic growers. Uh, we've always been sustainable farmers. We've always really had a lot of respect for our soils, for our vines. And in the past, we really tried to work as, as um, consciously as possible. Three years ago, we actually just said, let's take this leap of faith. Um, through a lot of research, we said like, it's really possible. So let's convert our farm to organic growing practices 100%. So we've been in the process, it's called in conversion to organics for the past three years. 1st of December, um, 2019, we were actually granted organic status, um, which is hugely exciting. So for me, it's a, a quest that's come through a whole couple of years of thinking about it. Um, a lot of things starting to make a little bit more sense. And when you look at it, growing grapes is taking a piece of land that would have been nature essentially and putting a commercial crop on it so what a lot of farmers tend to do is they say okay now we're farming grapes and that's what we do um, you create a monoculture in your vineyards and what we're trying to create through our organic farming practices to say but okay we're coexisting yes we are grape farmers but in the same time we're also farming on a piece of nature which we want to be as representative as possible to what nature would have done naturally. So organic farming is for me actually a concept. Um, I can go into a lot of detail. Um, I love this stuff, so I can really keep you busy for two days just talking about organic farming. But essentially it comes down to a concept and I always describe it as um, a concept that we can actually very easily grasp: human health. So 20 years ago, um, I think a lot of people were much more in a fast food culture so we ate a lot of fast foods, we drank a lot of coke, a lot of sugary drinks, um, didn't necessarily go to gym that often. Uh, so what you do is when you become sick, you go to the doctor, that time um, in, in, in our history, the doctors were I think also a little bit more lenient towards just giving you antibiotics and fixing you up. So you were actually treating a symptom the whole time. With organic farming we go the other route, we actually say let's not eat fast food three four times a week let's actually completely stay away from it um, let's eat salad even every now and again um, maybe even a little bit of vegetables let's drink some vitamins in the morning um, let's take the dog for a run every every two or three days and what you're doing through these lifestyle practices is you're actually growing an immune system and that's exactly what organic practices is so what we're doing is we applying a lot of detailed um, practices towards the soil. So that's introducing compost. It's introducing very specific um, cover crops that would naturally have been here. It's introducing a lot of native microbes back into the soil so that the soil actually starts building an immune system. Once you do that, that immune system will infiltrate back into the plant and eventually it will infiltrate back into the grape. And what we've already started seeing, um, only three years down the line, is berries with a lot more resilience, berries with a little bit more vibrancy, a little bit more depth, a little bit more complexity, which is amazing. Um, actually, just to, to showcase a little bit of what organic farming is all about. So here I've got a, a plant, it's called dandelion. So in the past, um, it's, not a, it's, it's classified as a weed. Now, the classification of a weed is actually something that grows somewhere where you didn't plant it. So it's a really wide concept. So in the past, I mean, it wouldn't have been bad or good. We would have just gone away and, and tried and get everything as neat as possible. And, and this would have probably suffered because of that. Now we say, okay, dandelion would be the preferred host of something like mealybug, something that we consider a pest in the vineyard. So in the past, take away the host and the, the mealybug had to come and live on your vine to survive. 
by now just keeping this very simple weed we're actually solving two problems you getting nature back to where it should be and you're also keeping the host for the mini bugs so they actually go and stay in the soil as opposed to your vines where they are a problem um, yeah so it's a really amazing journey uh, we can't wait to see where it takes us in the future Finally, we arrive at the cellar. Um, so the first thing that you will probably notice behind me is this big tower that's protruding from the cellar. That's actually very central to our whole way of thinking about making wine and very central, of course, to our cellar. So that tower is also the feature that gives our farm um, or our cellar its name. The tower actually means de Toren in Dutch. So the reason for that tower is that we were the first winery in South Africa to produce wines using a 100% gravity fed cellar. And that's how we utilize it. So in that um, tower, essentially, you've got a big goods lift um, with a tank on it that can go up three stories and it could go down one story. So wherever you need to take wine in the cellar, you'll actually just use it through um, the lift inside that cellar. Um, but first things first, um, so we've talked about a lot in the vineyards, how we go through a lot of processes to actually grow that perfect berry. And now it's time to start making wine. Now, of course, we think the moment that the berry arrives here, that's when the winemaking process starts. Not true. The winemaking process actually starts the moment that you cut the berry. Even before that, the most important decision, and I always joke and say they keep me on for 12 months of the year, to make a decision um, around about 20 times a year of when to harvest. I think that's a really, really important question that you've got to ask you yourself. When is the berries ready to be picked? Um, now we've got a lot of analysis. So we do something called berry sugar loading. We do our normal analytical analysis. We look at phenolic ripeness. We actually do phenolic testing on, on its own. Um, for me, the question is answered much more with the feeling. So it's when the berry actually speaks to you and say, I'm ready to go. Um, so what we're looking for is complexity. Now, complexity is not something that you can necessarily see in numbers. The numbers does give us a lot of information into where we are in that whole process. But complexity is something that you can feel and taste and, and actually sensorically experience. So because we've also got this bountiful of variants in the soils, all of the little different elements in the vineyards will get expressed at slightly different times. So that's what we do. We isolate all these different little parcels. We will go and taste them and analyze them separately. And when we reach the peak of complexity, that's when we will actually harvest it. Now, very important, a grape is not a climatoric fruit. So the moment that you cut the bunch from the vine, that is the best that that grape bunch and that grape berry will ever be. From there, you actually just start losing. So if you're going to allow that berry to sit in the sun, the temperature on the outside of that berry in a hot winemaking country like South Africa will almost go up to as high as 65 degrees Celsius. So there you start burning away all your flavors, all your aromas before you even start making wine. So very important for us, the moment that we cut the bunch, within an hour, we want that bunch placed in a cool room that we've got built here at the Turin. From there, during the course of the day, we will then take each of those bunches to a selection table where we will have 21 critical control points, essentially 21 people that will make sure that each and every berry is perfect before it goes into winemaking process. I'm on the crush pad at the moment, so this is where we actually receive the grapes after they've been cooled. Um, from here, we'll start moving into the cellar. As you can start hearing all the cellar noises, things are really buzzing in there, so uh, you'll see a lot of exciting things in there. So finally, um, before you go into the winery, we want to make sure that every berry is absolutely perfect, and that's why we've got all this machinery behind you. So essentially what the machinery does is it elongates the path where we can put human control points. And in South Africa, we're very fortunate, and the same year at Tour, that we are still being able to use that human intervention in making sure that every berry is perfect. So all we do is we've got a vibrating table over here with the grid on. Because we farm organically, we do have some dust particles on the, the bunches. We do have the odd insect that's gonna come through. 
Um, you do have this little raisins, always in winemaking, little bit of shot berries. This machine will take care of all of that for us, which will give the ladies that will be stationed all around here the opportunity to just focus on the bunches. We've got a very simple rule in selecting our grapes. If you don't want to eat a berry, we don't want to make wine from it. As simple as that, which simply means for every bunch that comes past, we will pick it up, we'll look at it. If there's a berry that you wouldn't deem fitable to eat, we take it out. Simple as that. The grapes then goes up this conveyor belt um, towards my left into a crusher. Now the crusher, which is essentially a destemmer, the crushing part was actually removed, will just gently knock the berries off the stems. Um, so the green berries, uh, no, the green stems will fall out the back. The perfectly ripe berries will fall through. As I mentioned, we don't crush the berries, so we keep the integrity of the berry all the way through this process. And then finally, the berries will all hop along that final vibrating table. And there we will have a team of six ladies, which will just remove any imperfections. So if a little raisin came through the whole process, we'll take that out. If even that little green stem that connects the berry to the rackers stays connected to the berry, we'll pick that out one by one. So once the berries falls into a stainless steel bin behind that process, that's the absolute best berries that we could have cultivated for that vintage. And that's what we'll take with gravity into the cellar. We will go into the fermentation tanks. So once the final selection of the berries has happened outside, we will now start conveying the, the grapes inside to the cellar. So behind me, you see one of our small little fermentation tanks. Um, we've got 14 of these, varying in sizes, all the way from sizes that can accommodate six tons of grapes down to as little as two tons of grapes, which is great because it means that essentially every little area in the vineyard that we see is different and that we sensorically think would be unique, we can ferment as a separate wine. So the grapes will fall outside in a stainless steel bin, as I previously explained. And then with gravity, it will be decanted into one of these tanks that you see behind me. Now, with the Bordeaux concept in our whole philosophy of making wine with the tower, with gravity, everything and all the focus is on actually growing the perfect berry. And in here, we always see it as not being a science experiment. Um, it's not a lab. We just want to take these beautiful berries and help it to turn into this beautiful wine. Um, so it's essentially just making sure that nothing goes wrong, let nature do its own thing. And to almost delve into that uh, philosophy, we had these tanks designed specifically for us. So they are just as high as they are wide, which means that we can work a lot less because the grape to skin contact ratio is actually very big. Standing on top of one of my favorite tanks um, of wine in the, in the cellar and one of the most famous vineyards at the Touring. It's a block of Cabernet, it's called A3 and A4, which is absolutely perfect. So what I've got here in my hands is some of the skins that will go into this fermentation. So the tank is almost done with fermentation. And what I want to highlight is that when you go through the skins, um, you still find a lot of this whole berries. And that's a testament to how soft we work. And it comes back to, again, the design of the tanks and the method of extraction that we use, which I will show you in a moment. What is special about this whole berries is that the wine will actually ferment inside the berry. It's a process called fermentation um, integral. Um, so when you pop them over during the pressing process, they actually just release a little bit of sugar again, a little bit of fruit, and it will give this nice, um, almost sensorically a little bit of fruit sweetness to the wine. Something that just makes the wine a little bit more enhanced in, in a lot of senses. So each fermentation at the Turin is unique and we will most of the time be led by what the grapes want us to do with it. So we will use different yeast, we will use um, cold soaking on some of the tanks, which is just a technique where you cool, uh, cool the whole tank down to actually release a little bit of tannins, a little bit of precursors of aroma. Um, working with gravity, we use two main techniques for extracting the color out of the skins. So what's very important to understand is if you've got a, a black skin berry in front of you, um, just pick from the vine, the outside skin 
is completely black, full of tannins, full of anticyanins, which is the color that you will eventually see. If you squeeze that berry open, the juice inside is still green, or let's call it white, so it's not colored. So all the goodness of a red wine actually comes out of the skin. So what's going to happen during this fermentation process is that the yeast will start converting the sugary juice to an alcoholic medium. During that process, you get carbon dioxide as a byproduct, which will catch onto the skins and will basically let all the skins rise to the top. So if this were to be a glass tank, you would actually see a whole bunch of skins and then some wine. So the problem for us or the challenge is how do you get the skins to release all that goodness into the wine. So one of the techniques that we will, will use is called manual punch downs, uh, which is great exercise. And what we do is very simply just pushing the skins back into the wine. So once you've completely immersed all the skins back into the wine, it normally takes about three to four hours for everything to rise to the top. And then we'll just do it again. Um, so depending on the block of wine, this is Cabernet. Um, it's quite a big, structured, expressive wine. So we want a lot of that greatness that is locked up in the skins in the wine. We'll do a little bit more punch downs. If you get, for instance, a very delicate Merlot, you'll do it a little bit less. Um, if you get a very specific block that needs to be treated in, in a little colder manner, so the, the fermentation is a little bit colder, we'll do that. Again, here you have to really sense what the grapes want you to do with them to make them great and then lock that greatness. We're in the main Deturin Fusion 5, Deturin Z and Deturin Delicat barrel room. So all our wines get matured in, in French oak barrels and American oak barrels, 225 liters specifically. So the reason why we, we use both French oak and American oak is that they both give this very unique nuances to the wine. The American oak we use specifically for Malbec. Now Malbec in itself, uh, for lack of maybe a better word, is a very voluptuous wine. So it's got a lot of aroma, a lot of textures, and American own on its, uh, oak on its own gives you this almost this nice sweetness, which basically just brings that wine together and package it really um, splendidly. The French oak wine, it, uh, French oak is a little bit more classical. So what it does is it allows the variety to shine through a little bit better. And that's what we use on our Cabernet Sauvignon, our Cabernet Franc, our Merlot, and our Petit Verdot. The barrels that we also use um, is new. Most of them is second full, and then we've also got a component that is third full. This is very important. Um, as you can imagine, a new French oak barrel or American oak barrel will give you a lot of wood components in the wine that is in it. So you also have to put a big, bold wine into a new barrel. Then if you use that same barrel a second time, a year later, the component of wood and wood characteristics that it will impart into your wine is a little bit less. The third time you use it, it's actually very little influence into what you would just find in a normal wine if you were to ace it in a stainless steel tank. Um, we use all these different techniques, all these different oaks from very specific forests, very specific grains, very specific toasting levels, three um, years of different age levels to build little micro components, essentially colors that we will paint our picture with. We're standing in a very special room at the moment. So behind me is the barrels for Book 17 and Black Lion, which are maturing. Um, in the background, you can also see a separate room where we actually ferment the barrels of the wine inside the barrels. So these two wines were born from a passion to achieve perfection. Um, as simple as that. We actually originated because 2009 was an amazing event in, in South Africa. Um, after all this, we sat down with the, with the young ones, we reflected a bit on them, and we actually asked ourselves the question, how do we make the best wine, not only in Stellenbosch, not only in South Africa, but how do we actually make a wine that can compete on the biggest stage of all and win? So that's a concept that we used here for Book 17 in Black Line. If you take everything except the absolutes out of the question, so here we talk for instance something like logistics, let's take it out of it, let's take labor out of it. Let's just talk about absolute great quality. How do you make the best wines in the world? Very simple. The 
the best wines in the world come from the best soils in the world. And that's what we identify as very first of all. So on our piece of land with the use of aerial imagery as well as comprehensive knowledge between myself, the managing partners, we've got a wealth of knowledge of actually farming this land, kilometers and kilometers of walking the land. So we identified the most perfect balanced spots. Then we go a step further and we say, okay, on these spots, let's go and identify the most balanced quality vines. We go a step further and on the most balanced quality vines, we ask ourselves the questions, what is the most perfect grapes? We will limit the amount of grapes to between six and eight bunches, depending on the vintage. Then we will go into little fine details and we'll remove the shoulder of the bunch, we'll remove the little bottom of the bunch and we'll only remain and keep the heart of the bunch. We'll wait for that to perfectly mature, after which we'll cut it. Each and every berry will be singly hand selected to go into this wine. It's a painstaking process where you will basically select 600 kilograms of grapes for almost 12 hours long. But the end result is exactly that, it's perfection. So once you've got these perfect berries, it's very easy to make perfect wine from it. Um, also the way that we grow the berries, it's in a much more opulent style. So we use a wide array of vineyard techniques to grow a berry that actually has got much more phenolic content, a berry that's got much bigger and wider range of flavor profiles, a lot more depth. So it's a very opulent berry that we actually grow. And what we want to make here is a wine that don't just show this as opulence, but all the, the restraint side, the little bit more mineral side. And that we incorporate by using a very minimalistic winemaking technique. So the berries will be decanted into small French oak barrels. So that is what you actually see in the background over there. And then the winemaking technique will only entail rolling that barrels every few hours, depending on the variety in there and the style that we want to achieve for that specific barrel. That process continues for almost upwards of two months, after which we will screen the grapes through a sieve, um, separating the wine and the skins. The skins will then go back into French oak barrels to mature for up, mode, oh, up to almost 24 months of aging. And that you will see in the room where I'm currently standing. The first wine we're going to enjoy today is the Detour and Delicat. It's the wine in our range that's a little bit more purposefully made, whereas I would describe the other wines much more reflective of the terroir and the vintage. So the wine's name actually says it all, Detour and Delicat. It's a wine made to be fresh, vibrant, youthful. Um, it's actually a wine that we want to enjoy in summertime, essentially. Um, so we purposefully make it so that you can drink it slightly chilled. And this goes, and we actually achieved this through a whole array of techniques um, that we employ. Um, some of them in terms of fermentation, we do things a little bit differently. And then a big portion of how we make this wine and how we make it that you can enjoy it a little bit um, colder is made through blending. So the first thing that we will use and the majority of the wine in here will be Malbec. But the Malbec is made with a slight twist. So the Malbec will come into the cellar, we will extract a lot of the juice, but we will not give it any skin contact. That Malbec, we will actually ferment as white wine. So you'll use a white wine yeast, you'll channel a lot of that flavors into a little bit more of a floral, fruity aspect. Really nice, fresh, crisp, refreshing. Um, but to give the wine a little bit more body and almost just bring it into the tour and stable and what we're known for, we want that little bit of grip, that little bit of volume on the palate. And for that, we blend back one year old Cabernet and Merlot, sometimes even one or two barrels of Cabernet Franc back into that Malbec. So what you end up when you chill the wine down is a wine that's really vibrant, really fresh. It's got this amazing crunchy red berries, a little bit of strawberry flavors. Um, when you put it into your mouth and you swallow it and you sip it and you just um, relax with it, it's got this really layered finish, which makes it great for pairing with food. So. Here I'm really thinking something like Spanish tapas, charcuterie, um, anything a little bit fatty like duck confit, um, pizza, and then of course during the epidemic, we use it for breakfast. So next 
Next up is the really spectacular the Tour and C 2016. This is our right bank Bordeaux style wine. Um, it's made to reflect the coldest vineyards that we've got, so on the south facing slopes. So in this wine, um, it's predominantly Merlot and Cabernet Franc. Those two varieties form about 70% of the blend, and they get support from Cabernet, a little bit, Cabernet Sauvignon, a little bit of Malbec, and a little bit of Petit Bordeaux to just bring the whole package um, into the glass. So the wine is very aptly named the Tour and Z for a very specific reason. Um, what cools this vineyard down is first of all the aspect, but also the sea breeze that we get from the, from the ocean, from the false bay, about 15 kilometers away from the farm. So Z stands for Zephyrus, which in Greek mythology is the god of the west wind. So everything here was designed to be as cold as possible, and that gets reflected in this beautiful blend. So on the nose, You'll smell this really, really nice, creamy, crunchy, um, really vibrant red cherries, blueberries, um, nice minerality coming through. And that's also what you're going to taste on the palate. So if you take a sip, um, spend a little bit of time with it, you get this really clean palate, um, with this really nice linear structures. And that makes it the most versatile of all our wines for pairing with food. So it does tend to go a little bit better with foods that's a little bit more rich. So if you've got this nice um, ribeye steak, if you can air, get your hands onto some Wagyu, I think that would be probably the best. Um, duck confit again goes really well with it, but it is really versatile. So if porcini mushrooms, it's going to pair absolutely perfect with that. Um, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, something like... Um, uh, rub curries works extremely well with that. So butter curries. Um, yeah, please do get some of that and enjoy it with this one. The Fusion 5 here with me was the first fiber eyed Bordeaux blend in South Africa. It's a left bank Bordeaux style wine, simply meaning that it's dominated by Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, for us, the next biggest variety would be Malbec, and then it's supported by Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and a little bit of Petit Bordeaux. This wine comes from our slightly warmer aspect, so west-facing, so it gets all that afternoon sun, and that's what we want to reflect in this bottle of wine. So you want to get all that warmth, that giving nature of that aspect. Um, Cabernet Sauvignon, like I said, takes a leading role in this. Um, so very classic, classically styled, um, very fine tannins. So when you smell the wine, again, you get this really layer of dark fruit supported by red fruit. Um, you get this little bit more tertiary nuances um, coming from, this, from the slightly newer French oak barrels. The wine, you can smell, it's got a little bit more volume already. Um, it's, it always sounds funny when you say you can smell the volume, but it, it's something that you can actually smell. You can smell that little bit more richness. And that's exactly what you want translated to the palate as well. So when you take a sip of this wine, and I can't stop myself, I'm just going to indulge for a moment. <laughs> it perfectly actually translates to what you're finding in there. So you just cold your old mouth, it's got this nice little bit of dryness that just wants you go, want to go back for another sip. It's got this richness, almost this little nuances of a little bit of fruit sweetness. Um, and again, you get that layers of black fruit, red fruit and slight minerality. A wine that really you can should just enjoy on its own. Um, but when it comes to food pairings, it's a little bit more classical in style. So you can actually pair it with a little bit more flavorsome but leaner meats. So something like um, fillet works really well, sirloin works really well. Like I said, just a glass of its own goes down so well. So finally we get to one of my favorite wines, the Book 17. Um, the wine, as I, as, as I previously mentioned, but maybe just to recap a little bit again, was this quest for perfection. Um, so it was really about taking all the elements, all the way from the soil, wine making process, bottling, packaging, and just getting to that absolute pinnacle of, of what we think we can achieve. And that's really where this wine was born. So the wine making techniques is, is really unique. We take this extreme care in the vineyards going down to berry level in that search of perfection. So once the wine has gone through the process of 24 months of barrel aging, we will end up blending it, um, bottling it, 
And the wine that we finally get in, in the glass, we want to showcase a wide array of techniques, um, essentially just showcasing the, the extreme care that we take and the precision in terroir that we select for this wine. So the style is slightly more rich. Um, we want the wine that's really opulent, giving, that's rich, that's expressive. But the key with wines like these is to make sure that you don't just go for the biggest, boldest possible wine that you can make. I think if you go in and you taste the best wines in the world that we want to compare this to, you will find that there's always a lot of elegance in these uh, wines and a big amount of restraint. And that's what we want in this wine as well. So when you first approach the wine, both on the nose, aromatically, we want the wine to show you all that potential. It must show you that I'm big, I'm bold, I'm opulent, but it must do it in a very restrained way. I always say that for me the biggest compliment is that when somebody takes the wine, they taste it, or they smell it first of all, they actually say, okay, I was actually expecting something a little bit bigger, bolder, but what impresses me is the finesse of the wine. And then as you sit and you play with it and you spend some time with it, it must just continuously bring that extra layers of fruit, that extra layers of expression, that extra layers of power to the, to the table. And that's also what we want on the palate. When you first take a sip of it, it must really wow you. It must show you all that potential that it's got. Um, but it should also show you the restraint. And then as you spend time with it, you take a second sip, a third sip. It should keep on revealing all that different layers that it's got. Um, so the wine itself, um, just to maybe backtrack a little bit, Book 17, the question always come, where does the name come from? And very aptly, it's a reference and an ode to somebody called Plinius the Elder. So he lived about 79 BC and he was a philosopher, a Roman philosopher that wrote some journals on everything from medicine to popular culture and in book um, 17, chapter 35, he wrote a scripture about viticulture and what he essentially said was that vineyards growing in the hilltops gives you more expressive grapes than vineyards growing in the valley floor. He also made the observation that vineyards that grows in the full sunlight gives you better quality wine than vineyards growing in the shade of a tree. Now this is just a reference to terroir and to know today we know why this is indeed the case. For us this wine comes from that pursuit of perfection and just finding that perfect spot. What you will mean I've noticed is that the wine comes very uniquely packaged. And this is something that we thought about a lot and, and really put a lot of effort into designing something that will fit the wine and the story behind the wine. So it's a, it's a product made by hand. And when I tilt the case a little bit, you will see that it's actually closed with a little Allen wrench. So the wine gets handmade in every sense of the word. And this just allows the client or the sommelier to just, just do that last little bit of manual labor, actually, to get it out. Um, I think it's a packaging that really bespoke, and it does speak to, the, to what is inside this really, this collector's item. Last but definitely not the least, um, our black line. So this is 100% Shiraz, um, coming from three different vineyard sites. So, Maybe just let me explain to you a little bit where the wine actually originated from and where it was born from. So after a few years of producing the book 17, the extreme care that we took in the vineyard and that little bit of extra steps that we took in the winemaking process proved to be so unbelievably effective in crafting world-class wines that we really said that we want to experiment a little bit more with that concept and that techniques. And what better way than to experiment on Shiraz? It's a variety that we all love. Um, and this was a great avenue for us to explore that in. So we don't have any, any Shiraz planted on the Detour and Vineyards itself. And this again, because we're working with a single variety, gave us the opportunity to go and diversify a little bit and go and find that really special spots all over the Western Cape where we can vinify the grapes um, from. So what we did is we initially just took um, the Western Cape, said, okay, this is the soils that we want to use, and this is the, the end product that we want to get from each of the different areas. So essentially, you're starting to put that puzzle together with all the little complex components 
to get to the final product. So we ended up finding a really special spot in the Swart plant on old decomposed granite. Old vines, um, upwards of 35 years old. Um, it's vines that gives you a really complex, a very powerful shiraz berry. So um, just to give you a little bit of context, a shiraz berry is normally about the size of that top part of my, my little index finger. Um, when you go to the shiraz in the swart plant, they're extremely tiny. They're about the size of my fingernail. So that can give you a little bit of context. Very powerful. Only that in a blend might be a little bit too much. So we started sitting in Stellenbosch for areas that will give us a little bit more finesse and another portion that will give us a little bit more um, of a wine that will just bring everything together. The area that will bring us the finesse is where we are situated. Um, so it's actually a neighboring farm where we get grapes from that gives you grapes not as powerful, but extremely elegant. Um, and then we've got a wine that we get from the Alderberg on this really deep, iron-rich coffee stone soils that will just bring everything together, the finesse and the power. Um, that's also maybe following on that, that where the name comes from. The black lion signifies um, the power, not only the power of the wine, but also the power of Africa, of our ancient soils. And a further ode to that is 40% of the wine comes from a winemaking region called the Swart Land, and Swart, directly translated into English from Afrikaans, means black. So everything back into, into that. So you'll see on the packaging, um, similar to what you would have found on the Book 17, we only make about 1,200 to 1,400 bottles each year. Each bottle comes individually numbered, also on top of the box. And these wines are really wines that we want to showcase over the next 25 upwards of 40 years. So it's wines that are made to actually age and to increase with quality and perceived quality in terms of flavor profile over that period. It's one of those wines that if you go through the effort of aging it over the next few decades, we want to reward you linearly for the time spent um, selling it. Thanks so much for spending this time with me, um, allowing me a little bit of time to show you all the insights into what goes into making our wines. I um, hope to see you very soon at the Tour and Private Cellar for a private tasting.